Luke chapter 11, and I've been talking about prayer. I, I believe the Lord had given me prayer for this whole month. And I'd like to read the first section, which is very familiar to you, but I hope that I will jar it out of its familiarity and the Holy Spirit can bring new things out. It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Well, the first thing I want to say is that, look, like I said last week, we got to be taught to pray. People think, well, just do whatever comes natural. Just say whatever comes to your head. <laughs> no. You've got to be taught to pray. Why? Because by nature, we're so alienated from God that we don't even know how to connect with him anymore. Now, who would be the best person to teach us to pray? Jesus. Why? Well, you need at least two qualifications to teach anyone to pray. You need to know what God wants perfectly. And you need to know what man is all about perfectly. I just want to point out the uniqueness of Jesus. Jesus is God. He is God. And yet, he's man. He's the man God. There'll never be another person like Jesus. There's never been one before and there'll never be another one. He's perfectly unique. That's why he's called our high priest. He alone knows what the only true God actually requires in every, every detail. And he knows uniquely what we're all about. Like even with our weakness, he walked where I walked, he stood where I stand, he felt what I feel, he understands. What a song, right? He knows our frailty, he shared our humanity, he was tempted in every way. Do you take any uh, joy out of that? That I got someone at the right hand of God that understands all of my sins, sorrow, weakness, shame, and he sits there and ever lives to make intercession for us. You believe that? So, first of all, you got you to be taught to pray. You, you don't want to just, uh, whatever comes to heart, you can't trust your heart. I mean, after all, what's God want? Well, I have no idea. Jesus knows, though. Jesus knows. What should I say? What should I pray for? How can communion with God be reestablished? Jesus came to bring us back to God. Okay? And then he says, and, and he said to them, when you pray, say... Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So simple. You could say it in 10 seconds. But it's not designed just as a verbal formula. It's an index. It's worth worth saying. It's worth saying. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever. Very much like the Ten Commandments. So few words, so much truth packed into it. What's he say to say first? Our Father which art in heaven. Our Father which art in heaven is the invocation. You know what? Just those words right there are so full of faith and love and hope. Our Father? You mean God's a Father? I'm a father. I know what it means to ache for a kid, to want to go so far toward them if they make one little move toward me. Or like the psalm says, as a father, father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. As a father pities his children, God is a father. To be able to pray like this, our father... So much faith in that, see? The whole thing is based on a loving relationship. The whole thing is based on father 
children, father children. In fact, Paul said that the, one of the signs that the Holy Spirit has come into your life in salvation, if you get nothing else, you get this little cry in your heart that will never leave. Abba, Father, Abba, Father, help Father. If nothing else, that's what the Holy Spirit will do in your heart. Our Father, but yet there's hope too. Our Father, which art in heaven. Well, I'm on earth, but he's in heaven. Yes, but he's going to take us there someday. One of the best things in the Bible is a golden passage that Jesus said. I call it a golden passage. Because basically Jesus is giving the little speech that a groom makes to a bride when he proposes in the first century in John 14. I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And, I, and someone says, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Look, Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. I'm not giving you complicated things today. No rocket science. But it needs to be reiterated in this modern day of pluralism. There is only one way that man can get back to God. There is only one way that God can be known. And that is through Jesus Christ. We're so far from God that what God had to do is become a man and come down and live among us. And our Father which art in heaven. And then he gives us the first... Um, the first request in his priorities. See, that's what I'm saying. We don't know how to pray, and we don't even know what the protocol is. After all, though you come to the Father, your audience is with the king of the whole universe. Your audience is with the king, the creator, the ruler. Well, what's he say? What's he want? Well, the first thing he says, the most important thing of all, the, the invocation, the way to open is to pray that God's name would be hallowed. Hallowed be thy name. Now, that's the highest good there is. Hallowed be thy name. See, what, what, what you got to, you know, without giving the words or the tech, technical details of prayer, it's my burden to under, give what undergirds prayer and the spirit of prayer that you should be in as a Christian and as a spiritual person. What does it mean to be spiritual? Spirituality is just a reflection of the object that you worship. We worship a holy God. What does that mean? We worship a holy God. There's a passage in the book of Proverbs that says, By the knowledge of the holy comes understanding. By the knowledge of the holy. doesn't even say holy one. just says holy. This whole idea of holy. What does it mean? Well, holy means separate. That nobody is like God. That's why it's a sin to make an idol. Because you can never make a likeness to God. Any likeness at all would be like, let's say you, you hire someone to paint a portrait of you. And the day came and they unveiled the painting and you saw a cockroach sitting there. Okay. They didn't do justice to you, did they? <laughs> we just sang it. Who is like unto thee? Who is like unto thee, O Lord? Not Jesus. Is the image of the invisible God. Okay. You got to have, in order to have a real and spiritual prayer life, a sense of the holy. What does it mean, holy? Most people think holy in terms of purity, which purity is part of it. But really, the truest meaning of holy is separate, other, okay, above. Like we quoted the verse last week, God is above, okay. He's other, he's separate. The third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Why? The Lord is a jealous God. He will not hold you guiltless if you take his name in vain. His name is not like my name or your name or your name or your name. It's separate. It's separate. And, and to be spiritual is to have this sense of holy. 
Holy God, we praise thy name, was the song that my mother taught us to sing. Lord of all, we bow before thee. All on earth thy scepter claim, all in heaven above adore thee. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I hope by the grace of God I can communicate to you the meaning of holy. Separate. Now there are things that God has instituted in human life that are holy things. But all that means is that they're reflections of him himself. For example, life is sacred. This is the great sin of America, abortion. Life is sacred. You cannot treat it as common. The opposite of holy is common. Oh, if that child is a kid convenience, then you can abort it. This is the, mo- this is the, the unholiest aspect of America, is this abortion culture. It is so evil, it's unreal. What, abort what? Abort the image of God? For what? Life is holy. So it's unholy people that don't have uh, an idea of the holiness of life. Sex is holy. In other words, sex is bigger than us. The Bible says a marriage bed is to, marriage to be honored by all. And the marriage bed is to be undefiled. What does that mean? That means you, when, you, when you're talking about something like human sexuality, you're talking about something bigger than we are, above us, something to be guarded, something to treat with reverence, something to never violate. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Okay, sex is holy. That means it's above us. You transgress it, you transgress the holy. Okay. I believe that children, in a sense, are holy. Jesus said, whoever makes one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for him. He'd have a better chance of surviving. If you put a millstone around his neck, threw him into a lake of fire, he'd have a better chance of getting out than, than, if, than you if you make a little one to stumble. Children are sacred. It's, it's interesting and ironic and sad and frightening it's after abortion is legalized that then you have the problem with child trafficking. Let me tell you something. Some very, very profoundly unholy people are running the world these days. Unholy on a level we can't even grasp. So the opposite of holy is profane. Okay? So we talk about profanity. Someone uses profanity. Well, everyone, I don't know. <laughs> I've even heard preachers use profanity. And people are so saturated with profanity that even girls use profanity and boys use profanity. Everyone uses profanity. You never heard a girl use profanity when I was a kid. You know, well, maybe some girls. I don't know. I never met any. What is profanity? Well, profanity basically revolves around two subjects. Sex and God's name. What does it mean to be profane? That every other word is F this and F that. What you're doing is taking something sacred that's above you and bigger than you. Something that one day will be the basis of judgment. And you're pulling it down saying, you know, I don't fear God. In fact, I think I'll wipe my feet on this. Sex. Doesn't matter. And when they see a GD and Jesus Christ, which my wife always says, is Lord. <laughs> what are they doing? Notice they don't say Muhammad or Buddha. Why? Because those, those aren't real. They're not holy. There's only one holy God, right? The holy God, we praise thy name. And they say, Jesus Christ, what are you doing here? And what they're doing is taking something so high above them. Some little tiny person is going to make themselves elevated by daring 
to take a holy name in vain, to bring it down beneath their level, that they might wipe their feet on it. That's no wonder the third commandment. It's too bad the Ten Commandments don't get discussed that all that much anymore. The third commandment, the Lord will not hold you guiltless if you take his name in vain. You'll visit the sins down to the third and fourth generation on all those who hate him. That's it. That's what unholiness is, is hatred of God. But we come back to the Lord's Prayer. He says, this is your number one request, above all else. If you're going to ask for anything, start right here. Our Father, which art in heaven, oh, may your name be regarded as holy. It wouldn't be the first request that man would come up with. Ever notice that? I often talk, you know, <laughs> about the Ten Commandments. And you could do a you could do a survey. A thousand people. Let's say a thousand people call themselves Christians. And you can ask this question. Which would be the worst possible commandment to break? And you'd get a few answers. I know for sure you're gonna get thou shalt not murder. Well that's bad. Murder is evil. What makes murder evil? You're destroying the image of God. You don't have the right. Amen? Amen. Or you'd get something, expansion on that. Genocide. Man, you can't get more evil than genocide. Genocide is about as evil as anything. And people wipe out whole classes of people. Genocide is happening all over the world to this day. Man is just so evil that he would just, he, they hate each other and they're going to wipe each other out, right? So I agree. And then someone would say, you shall not commit adultery. I get it. There's nothing as painful as giving your life to someone and having them betray you on that level. It's sick. It's evil. It's profane. Or someone might even do an expansion on that one. Well, I think rape is the worst commandment. Well, I couldn't argue with that. But one thing I know you'll never hear is anyone raise their hand and say, I think taking God's name in vain, that would be the worst thing you could possibly do. Or, I think having other gods beside the only true God. Or someone say, I think making an idol... If they did do that after rape, murder, genocide, adultery, abortion, and someone raised their hand and said that, most of the rest of them go, are you crazy? Taking God's name in vain compared to genocide? What's that teach us? Not much about God. It teaches us everything we need to know about ourselves. You know what that teaches us? that we're man-centered, that we never even think to look at things according to God's value system, that we don't get it. Or that, like the Proverbs chapter 9, by the knowledge of the holy comes understanding. The number one prayer request. Oh, notice he didn't say, Pray that there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Okay. Nope. See, see, part of the problem is, okay, back to the Ten Commandments allegory. The Ten Commandments are divided into two tables. The first table has to do with your relationship with God, and the second table has to do with how we relate to each other. So when they always go to the second table, that means that they're deficient in some understanding of real and true religion, which is God-centered. Everything is man-centered, see? So everything's got to come from the second table, and they never even give it a thought. They wouldn't give it a thought. They can't give it a thought because they don't th think that way. But in true religion, it's God first. The truth is, everything in the second table of the law that men do, flow out of the basic fact that they're in violation of the first table of the law. Murder, adultery, genocide, abortion, all the sins of our nation. 
It's because we don't love God. And we've left God, and we don't worship God. So Jesus giving the number one chief prayer request. When you pray, start here. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Would you give people a sense of who you are? That's what you're praying. Only intelligent and loving beings that are free moral agents can hallow the name of God. Angels and men and women. Only intelligent, free moral agents. I, I stand stunned at the basic profanity that, that we're at now in our society. It just shocks me. It just shocks me. And by the way, underneath all that profanity is hatred. You know, if you hate marriage, if you're pornographic, you you hate. You hate. People talk about the love revolution, the sexual revolution. That killed marriage. Are you kidding? Killed romance. (laughs) Slaughter. (laughs) Abortion. Here we are. So many years later, I knew we were in trouble. I wasn't even Christian when Roe versus Wade happened, but my mother and I used to talk about it right before she died. Man, if this ever happens, oh man, we're in trouble. I knew we'd be degraded. Well, let me not get off my text too far. He takes us back. You want to pray? You want to be useful to God? To start here, start praying that God's name would be hallowed. This is a prayer that implies the desire to know God. How many here know God? Amen. Thank you, God. You can't, God can't be known outside of Jesus Christ. But God's knowledge is plumbless. If you only know God today the, the, to the level that you knew God on the day that you asked Jesus to forgive your sins, that's a shame. You should be praying to know God himself, to know what the holy is and the knowledge of the holy. It's a prayer to, to look unto Christ because Jesus is the image of the invisible holy God. And It's a prayer that God would be treated as a reality. See, part of the problem of living in the world is it deadens your spiritual capacity. The world is such an an effective anesthetic. Just kill all spiritual feeling, spiritual impulse, spiritual desire, spiritual aspiration. Just kill it. That's what worldliness does. Now, God said he would teach us his name. Jesus prayed on the night he was betrayed. I have declared your name to them. Oh, you want to know God? Look at Jesus. It's a, how it be thy name is a prayer to rejoice in God's name. And it's also a prayer that we would, we and everyone else would separate in our own soul the name of God from our own opinions or corrupt thoughts or desires. I'll tell you what I mean by that. People often say, you know how I like to think of God? I go, don't go no further. (laughs) Why? Because it doesn't matter what you think of God. I mean, it matters to you. The most important thing about you is what you think of God. The determining factor of your life is whether or not you see God right. The whole, the most important thing about any human, whether they're atheist, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever, the most important thing about them is how they see God. If you get God wrong, you are messed up. You are messed up. Now, how can I see God right? Well, God has revealed himself. God has revealed himself to us. 
you know, you see the piety of the Old Testament, you know, it's spiritual. They, they knew God because God revealed himself to them and they prayed accordingly with reverence. Now, the Bible talks a lot about the fear of God. Okay, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you see God, of course, fear comes into play. Look at Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. How I love this teaching of Jesus. That's what you say. That's where you start. Pray that the name of God would be holy. Now reverence, which is a, a real, the real spiritual way to approach God. It has to do with dread and fear, because you see God as he is. That is a dreadful sight. But reverence is only possible if love is in it. Love. Love. When this is this is how it works. I'll quote a very oft quoted Psalm. Psalm one thirty says, "If you regard an iniquity, Lord, yeah, who could stand?" But he said, "With you is forgiveness." that you might be feared. What does it really mean to be spiritual? It means to love God, to adore his name, to truly fear him, but with love because of redemption. Jesus died so that we can know God. See what I mean by just few words in the Lord's Prayer, but so much, so much I'm having a hard time myself. Put it into words. He says in Isaiah 6, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly, the seraphims. Seraphim is a Hebrew word that means burning ones. Some kind of angel that's burning. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The earth is not the Lord. The earth is the showcase of the Lord's glory. All is not one all is two, God and his creation. And the seraphim can only say to each other, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. You know what the other one says back? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now look at the impact of these holy beings on this man of God. The post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I'm undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. See what happened here? When he saw God, he saw himself. When he saw God, he saw himself in a way he'd never seen himself before. Woe is me, that's calling damnation on his head. That's a way of saying, I'm going to hell and I deserve it. Why? I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the king in his glory. He saw the holy God and he saw himself in the light of the holy God. And then... He stands there, calling damnation on himself. And then you get this beautiful but mysterious action. Verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he took with the tongs from off the altar. 
you have an altar with burning coals. You have the seraphim take the tongs, pick up one of the coals, and he comes and he touches on the prophet's lips. And he laid it on my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. See, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God is holy. And when unholy people come into the presence of the holy God, they feel it. Sinners dread the idea of a holy God because they know that it involves judgment. He stands there. It's the story of my life and it's the story of a lot of your lives. I didn't know that much about God other than my basic religion my parents taught me. I thank God for that, but then we got into the Catholic thing. And... But one day I read the Sermon on the Mount and I heard the law of God Jesus told us the real meaning of the law of God. It's not enough not to kill someone. You hate someone. Not enough not to commit adultery. You lust. And I was like shattered like Isaiah. Because I saw something there. And I thought, God, I'm on my way to hell. Woe is me, I'm undone, I'm on my way to hell. And then I found out that Jesus died for me that the altar of God, in my case, wasn't a table of live coals, but a cross. Jesus died on the cross because we're sinners. And the coal touching the lip, didn't Paul teach us? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Cold touch my lips. I've never been the same since. Never been the same since. Now I can worship and adore him who is holy. Out from underneath the penalty. Reconciled back to him who is holy. Now I have an understanding that's been growing. The knowledge of the holy. Let me move on and I'll close here. He says, uh, only, only the redeemed, only people that are saved can actually join with those angels and worship and adore the holy God. By the way, that's the way to be healed in your life. That's the way to get your whole life back. The most important thing in anyone's life is how they see God. And because that screwed up everything else, your moral life, your mental life, your marital life, your happiness is all tied up in that. It's all tied up in that. And the only way back is through the cross and the worship of the thrice holy God. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. There's a New Testament version of that. Peter, the rough old fisherman, he wasn't a believer. And he's coming in from a night of frustrating fishing. Hadn't caught a thing. And there's a preacher on the shore. And everyone knows preachers always want something from you, right? <laughs> and Jesus said, Peter, can I use your boat? And Peter said, uh, you may as well. I couldn't catch anything. And Jesus sat in the boat and taught the people on the shore. Beautiful. And then as he's done, he said to Peter, why don't you launch out again? Unfurl your nets you just put away. Get the crew back out here and go fishing. And at first Peter, uh, Peter uh, argued with him. We've been out all night long fishing. We didn't catch anything. I'm the fisherman here. You're a preacher. But then he said, well, because you said it. So they got the nets out, and they got the crew back on the ship. It's all found in Luke 5. They push out from the shore. They let down their nets. Jesus is standing right there in the boat. And they bring up more fish than the nets can even contain. They have to call their partners over with their boats to get them. But Peter's reaction is very similar to Isaiah's. Well, what it literally says in the Gospel of Luke is looking up and falling down. 
He looked up at Jesus and fell on his knees. And he said, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. And Jesus' reaction was very similar to what happened with Isaiah. Both Peter and Isaiah found out one simple, beautiful, glorious truth. Holiness will expose who you really are. Isaiah couldn't look at the Lord without hating himself. And Peter finally saw who Jesus was. He saw through the disguise. And he hated himself too. But neither one of them left. Here's what they found out. If you'll stay in the light of God, the same light that exposes your sin and evil will actually purify you of it. If you'll stay in the light. O oh, our Father, who art in heaven, may your name be regarded as holy. May your true self be revealed to this sinful, profane world. May your true name be revealed to the remnant of your true church, that we might proclaim your name among the nations. May your name be revealed in every family where the family is under assault and there's much attack that is sinful, degrading, and is nothing more than an attack of hell to defile the families. Let your name be glorified, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.